Hello and welcome to this ENT recall of INISET May 2025. I am Dr. Sanjay Garwal, your ENT faculty. So we had six questions from ENT, like usual in INISET, the number of questions are not too many. But the good thing is that all the questions were from the class notes. Let's start with the question. Now, question number one says, which of the following is incorrect about juvenile angiofibroma? Biopsy is taken under LFO diagnosis, unilateral nasal obstruction, recurrent epistaxis, seen exclusively in adolescent males. Now the name of the disease is juvenile angiofibroma that tells you it is seen in juvenile age group is mainly seen in males. So this is true. Then because it's a, a angiofibroma is a, a vascular tumor of the nose and so recurrent epistaxis is the most common complaint. And because it arises from the sphenoplatine foramen on one side, so often it is unilateral obstruction, but if it becomes too big, it can be bilateral. And it's a very, very simple thing to know that biopsy is contraindicated because the vascular tumor and you can't take biopsy from here because bleeding can be a problem. And I think this question has been asked in the past also. Very regular points, very easy point. So easily A is a correct answer for this. Then we talk about Question number two, he says, a 45 year old man came with complaint of vertigo on changing position and vomiting during early mornings. What is the diagnosis? BPPV, vestibular neuronitis, Meniere's disease, autosclerosis. Now the giveaway in this uh, question is the fact that the patient has vertigo while changing the position of the head. And when the patient has vertigo while changing the position of the head, this is called positional vertigo. And positional vertigo is typically seen in BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Now, out of the conditions given here, these are all inner ear diseases, BPPV, vestibular neuronitis, Meniere's disease, or autosclerosis is a middle ear disease. Now, these two, that is BPPV and neuronitis, these are the two conditions where the vertigo is, only vertigo is the complaint. And Meniere's can cause SNHL plus vertigo and autosclerosis usually no vertigo. So autosclerosis is straight well ruled out because there is no vertigo, it's a middle ear disease and autosclerosis is seen in females, that to young females, not in males, the patient is a male and in autosclerosis there is no vomiting and all. So you might be confused between these three conditions that is BPPV, vestibular neuronitis and Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease, the most important symptom is tinnitus and hearing loss. Vertigo is less common. Here, the vertigo is the only complaint. So, Meniere's is absolutely ruled out. And <clears throat> vestibular neuronitis, the vertigo is long-standing, continuous, not episodes. This patient has an episodic vertigo in the morning only. And for only when the patient is changing the head, uh, vestibular neuronitis does not behave like that. It's the continuous vertigo for many days, even weeks and months can happen. So BPPV, benign, paroxysmal, positional vertigo, straight away, no doubts about that. Then we talk about question number three. A four-year-old boy presented with difficulty in opening his mouth and painful tonic movement of the limbs after an ear infection. What is the diagnosis? Basal sepsis, sigmoid sinus thrombosis, tetanus, meningitis. Now, truly speaking, this is not an ENT question. They have tried to confuse you by giving A about the ear infection. And three out of four choices are related to ear. So in the exam, you might be just thinking about ear and actually the answer is nothing to do with ear. See, uh, Bezol's abscess is an abscess of sternocleidomastoid muscle. And sternocleidomastoid muscle has nothing to do with opening or closing of the mouth. So there'll be no uh, lock jaw and it has nothing to do with limbs. So again, this is absolutely ruled out. Sigmoid sinus thrombosis, again, it has nothing to do with limbs and opening of the mouth. Uh, usually, the patient has sigmoid sinus had fever, uh, fever and headache. Fever is picket fence fever. And the signs like Gracinger signs, Delta sign, Krobeck sign, Tobe air sign. And this kind of presentation does not happen here. And so is meningitis. Meningitis again has fever, headache, raised intracranial pressure, and nothing of the sort is given. Very typically in tetanus, there is, you know, spasm of the muscles and so this kind of presentation can happen in tetanus. So tetanus is the correct answer. Once again, I'm telling you this was like a trap question. Nothing to do with ear and especially 
uh, they told you the patient is with ear infection. So they had to tell some kind of infection, any part of the body, the infection can start. In this case, maybe in ear. That was the only thing. So tetanus is the right answer in this particular case. So it's a nice question actually, in my opinion. Then question number four, which of the following are common cause of strider in neonates, subglottic stenosis, laryngomalacia, recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, hemorrhagic polyp. So either A and B, A and C, B and D, C and D. These are the four choices. Now, a neonates with strider. Now, subglottic stenosis can be a congenital disease or due to intubation. If it is intubation causing uh, subglottic stenosis, uh, it can happen at any age. It depends on when the patient has been intubated. But congenital disease causing subglottic stenosis uh, can present as titer in neonates. So this is possible. Then laryngomalacia, we all know, is the most common congenital disease of the larynx. And the most common presentation is again strider in neonates few months after the birth it usually starts so this is also possible now recurrent laryngeal respiratory papillomatosis you know the other name for this disease is jorrp what is jorrp juvenile onset recurrent respiratory papillomatosis the name of the disease carries the word juvenile onset so this starts in the juvenile age group which is around 8 9 10 11 12 at that age group so if a juvenile person that between let's say 10 to 16 comes to with hoarseness of voice then this is the first thing that should come to your mind but not in neonates neonates don't have papilloma easily but if there is a papilloma hoarseness is the main complaint but can have strider also if the papilloma is widespread involving too much of the airway then of course strider can happen so strider can happen in uh, papilloma uh, respiratory papilloma but not uh, in the neonates so this is not possible in this particular person and hemorrhagic polyp again is unlikely in a neonates because hemorrhagic polyp, polyps and nodules are seen due to chronic misuse of voice. Misuse of voice. And this is seen in adults who misuse the voice either because of singing or teaching. It can happen in small child. Those who cry too much, scream, they, you know, that few kids of two, three years, they keep on crying and screaming. They can happen, have, but again, neonates don't cry like that. So, and even if the polyp happens, strider is very, very unlikely. Uh, polyp also causes hoarseness of voice mainly. Strider is very uncommon. So this is again ruled out. So the likely answers are A and B. And A is the, uh, I mean, choice A and choice B both are potential conditions where neonate can have strider. And A is that choice having A and B. So A easily is the correct answer. Again, simple question. And strider, this kind of disease we discuss in class all the time. Question number five. A 50 year old with pain during deglutition. On examination, there is a fish bone in the piriform fossa. Which nerve could be the cause? Now, in all my lectures, with the help of a very nice diagram, I show you this specific question. In fact, the last TND, just a few days back that I had taken, I had given almost a similar question with the image based question, exactly the same, almost like the, you know, they have picked this question and put here. So in piriform fossa, uh, which is the most common site of foreign body, fish bone is a very common foreign body. And if it pierces the medial wall of the piriform fossa, there is an internal laryngeal nerve. See, external nerve is outside the larynx, outside. So if there is a fish bone inside, it cannot damage the nerve outside. Glossopharyngeal nerve has nothing to do with larynx. Glossopharyngeal nerve supplies the oropharynx and the up, up area. So uh, this fish bone is in the pyrimphal fossa, laryngopharynx. It's a part of hypopharynx, which is part of the laryngopharynx. And laryngopharynx has nothing to do with the ninth nerve. So this is absolutely out. And hypoglossal, of course, is that motor nerve supplying the tongue. Again, tongue, nothing to do with laryngopharynx. So this was the easiest question, I, in my opinion, in this particular session and internal laryngeal is a correct answer now let me show you the exam uh, the image of a, a laryngopharynx this is a laryngopharynx and this is an actual laryngopharynx of a human cadaver which has been taken out now this thing is the larynx 
and we breathe through here. This is the tongue. Tongue. This area is the vellicula area. And this is your piriform fossa. This and this. Piriform fossa. Right. And so we swallow through this. The food that we swallow goes through here into the esophagus down. And this is the most common site of foreign body also. Now this wall, which is a common wall between the piriform fossa and the larynx, is called airy epiglottic fold or AE fold. And this fold runs from arytenoid. This is the arytenoid roughly. And this is the epiglottis. This is the epiglottis. So because this fold runs from arytenoid to the epiglottis, that's why it's called airy epiglottic fold or AE fold. And as you can see, you can easily make out this is a common wall between the larynx, which is this, and pyriform fossa, which is this. Now, on the pyriform fossa side, on this wall, just below the mucosa runs the internal laryngeal nerve. So internal laryngeal nerve is somewhere here in this A fold. And so when there is a pyriform fossa foreign body, especially fish bone, it can easily pierce into this mucosa. It has to just pierce few millimeters in the mucosa and can damage the internal laryngeal nerve. This is usually the end of the nerve. The nerve comes from the top in the larynx and goes down from the supraglottis and ends over here in this area. And so this gets damaged in a fish bone quite commonly. And like I said, this question we have discussed almost ditto in the, not in the class, of course, we discussed all of all the questions from the class, but in the TND also, this was discussed. And the last question that was asked in ENT, what are the indicators for cochlear implant? Now, this part uh, I discussed in the class very, very in great details that hearing loss are of two types, CHL and SNHL. In CHL, conductive hearing loss, most of the conductive hearing loss are treated with medicines and surgeries. And despite medicine and surgery, if the patient still does not have the hearing uh, improvement, they still have hearing loss, then you have to give hearing aid to improve the hearing. And if the hearing aid is not too good for the patient, the patient is not satisfied with the hearing aid, there is nothing else we can do in that case. Hearing aid is the last option. Of course, there are different types of hearing aid that can be used, but hearing aid is the last option, nothing else. Whereas in sensory neurating loss, again, we try to treat SNHL with medicines and surgeries. And if there is not too much of an improvement in the hearing, then again, we can get the hearing aid in that patient. If the hearing aid fails, now this time you have an option of cochlear implant, or a brain stem implant. So these two implants, cochlear implant and brain stem implant are not options for CHL. They are only option for SNHL. Now, if you have to select between cochlear implant and brain stem implant, then you have to find out who is causing that SNHL. If the SNHL is caused by cochlear disease, disease of the cochlea, then the implant that can be used is cochlear implant. But if that SNHL is caused by eighth nerve disease, which is called retrocochlear disease, then the only implant you can use is brain stem implant. That means if cochlear implant has to be used, that means the disease must be a cochlear disease. That's what I'm trying to say. Other part disease of every part, other part of the ear, cochlear implant is not a useful thing. Now, congenital hearing loss can be due to any part. Congenital can be the middle ear disease, uh, inner ear disease, even neural disease. Neural disease are very uncommon, but middle ear and inner ear both can cause. So let's assume that more commonly congenital disease of the hearing are the inner ear diseases. So in congenital hearing loss, we can use most of them, not all of them. If they are middle ear disease, congenital, then we cannot use. So we are assuming that these are congenital inner ear disease and so congenital, uh, cochlear implant can be used. In fact, the most common use of cochlear implant is small kids with congenital hearing loss, most of them. So it's one of the most common indications actually. Then which is a part of the cochlea, outer hair is a part of the cochlea. And if the outer cell gets damaged, causing hearing loss, again, cochlear implant can be used. Autosclerosis is a middle ear disease causing conductive hearing loss. I already told you in conductive hearing loss, autosclerosis is not beneficial, so it cannot be used. And stapes fixation, which is again a middle ear disease, and it will also cause conductive hearing loss, so we cannot use. That means cochlear implant can be used either for congenital hearing loss or autotoxicity. So A and B are the conditions where it can be used, and this is choice A. So this is your correct answer. So these were the six ENT questions that I know of and these are the right answers. If you still have any questions or doubt, you can post that question to us and we'll take up that in future. Okay. So with this, I come to the end and I really hope that you have done this paper nicely and you'll get the subject of your choice in one of the premium institutes. So with this, I'm signing off. 
and thanks for attending best of luck once again